point in time when Bob Osgood started publishing his book, and her uh, uh, Patty was running his schools, is the point at which I believe modern square dancing started to be something different from traditional square dancing. Uh, we can speculate forever, but uh, Jay King, in writing his book, said when Herb Gregerson first called, uh, had couples down the center and separate around and one come into the center, uh, square dancing changed. Its choreography changed right about then. And that happened somewhere in the late 1940s. It continued that formation that I'm going to go fairly technically into choreography here because this is a period of 15 years, well, 20 years from 1950 on until the formation of Call Lab was a period of drastic transition in, in square dancing. Uh, the traditional form, what Henry Ford was writing about and dancing and promoting stayed pretty much unchanged. It has changed very little even to today. It's continuing to be popular, uh, but a little sight spur broke off from that with Herb Gregerson's creation of what we call goalpost choreography. And we started uh, discovering that we could, once we got them around and into the center, could do all kinds of things and then continue through the other side and on around the goalposts and back down the center, and that <coughs> formation was the, the core of square dance action throughout much of the 50s. <coughs> Somewhere in the middle of the 50s, we in started inventing calls. It was about 55, 56, but the call square through fell into place, and it fitted very nicely into that goalpost type of choreographic action. In those days, the important distinction, in my mind, between traditional and modern square dancing still was not very much in existence. That distinction is that in traditional square dancing, the dancers learn a dance routine. And it is danced pretty much the same way every time it's done. The caller, uh, sometimes properly referred to as a prompter, is really prompting the dancer's memory of a routine that is not changing. <laughs> Somewhere in the early 1950s, we began to discover, maybe because the sound equipment was good enough, that we could change that routine while it was being danced. It got to be pretty scary because you did still want to get people back to their corner and their home place, and if you had them out of order, they couldn't promenade back home. We solved that problem for a whole decade of the 50s, really by limiting our changing of the pattern to the circle formation. The routines still were memorized pretty much by everybody. Complete routines from start to finish. And if you look at Sets and Order magazine during that period, the routines are written out with all the filler words, all, you, you learned the whole routine word by word without much understanding of what the choreography was doing. But we got to play when we put them in circles. And circle left and right, we could do forward and back in the grand right and left pattern. And as long as we got one couple back with their partner, we didn't have to worry. We never changed the rotation of the men. And we could move the ladies around. Uh, we didn't very often put a lady's chain into those circle formations. Uh, the lady's chain was part of the memorized routine. But we sure did circle breaks, the Alaman breaks. We had a full alphabet of Alaman breaks from an Alaman A, Alaman left for an Alaman A, a right and a left and a half sachet. And went on to Alaman O, right and left and a do pass O. And Alaman we, right and left and turn back three. We had a whole alphabet of them. And uh, in fact, it was published in American Square Dance, uh, the entire alphabet. But we didn't mess with the figure very much. It was still very much a memorized, complete routine. Some callers began to experiment. 
and Ricky Holden was a, a caller who traveled around the country a great deal. Uh, Ricky got fascinated and shared information that he came in contact with a gentleman by the name of Lloyd Littman. And Lloyd Littman was uh, a choreographic whiz. He began to think about the concepts of choreography and he wrote a book called Instant Hash. Uh, it was the place where the concept of zeros and equivalents came into being or was written down. Uh, they identified the fact that you could not memorize a whole routine. You could memorize one sequence of calls that returned you to the same place you were when you started that sequence. And then you could insert that into your memorized routine. And that began to open up floodgates. It turns out that, to my considerable surprise when I discovered it a few years back, all of the major methods of choreographic management were written down, documented, in the first five years of the 1960s. Uh, Littman's book, Instant Hash, uh, Les Gotcher wrote a book, Jay King wrote a book, Bob Dawson wrote a book, and sight calling as a term came into being. As an actual filled out method, it took another 10 years before we really understood what sight calling meant, and it was another 10 years after that, well into the 1970s and early 80s, before any substantial number of callers were in fact using sight calling. But the zeros and equivalents <laughs> opened an interesting opportunity for us, because we could invent a new call, create a zero using it, and then plug it into all the routines that we had already memorized. And that opportunity opened a floodgate that we could not possibly have imagined. Bob Osgood wrote somewhere around 1960 that he was astounded to discover when he cataloged all the calls he could find that there were some 800 of them. <laughs> Burleson, when he came out with the first encyclopedia in the late 70s, no, late 60s, I think, uh, had 2,000 calls, 2,500 calls. And four years later, it was 4,000. <laughs> the acceleration happened in, in large part because they were so easy to use. They, the caller could just read the call, figure out how it worked, add whatever it took to get you back to the place where you started it. And then it plugged into our standard formation. Uh, in 1957, I think it was, uh, the chicken plucker pattern was created. It was written as everything was then, as a full dance. And the full dance was the chicken plucker pattern that we know so well. Uh, we got into the starting position, uh, first of all, by having a head couples roll away, box the hat, and face the sides, because square through had not yet come into full use. But once you discovered that square through put you in the starting position for a chicken plucker, it became 80% of our dance choreography and remains that today. <coughs> but the increase in our vocabulary was a major issue throughout the 1960s. It turned out to be a wonderful way to answer everybody, every caller's major worry, and that was how to keep the dancers from being bored. <coughs> the other problem we had to cope with was how to call without boring so that both new dancers and experienced dancers could <coughs> dance together. And the new call provided that opportunity because we could teach the new call, which the new experienced dancers had not yet seen. And as long as they could learn reasonably well, the new dancer could cope. The pattern remained pretty standard. We were doing chicken plucker uh, long before we recognized it as a nameable pattern. But traveling callers routinely taught four, five, six new calls in an evening. Each new call was the basis for a separate tip. And most of the evening's dance was learning new calls. The experienced dancers got very 
concern because they kept on wanting to know the calls the caller was going to use. They never did figure out that they didn't have a chance. <laughs> I, I remember Will, Les Gotcher at a dance, ripping open an envelope saying, just got this from a friend George down in Texas, let's try this one. And then he'd walk us through the figure and call a dance with it. Uh, standard procedure. Answered the question, didn't, nobody got bored. Uh, the new dancers had been burned as well as the experienced dancers, and we all danced together happily. Lots of people remember those days fondly, but pretty soon the dancers began to figure out that these calls didn't come back. And they put a lot of effort into learning them, and, and when are we going to hear them again? Uh, club callers got a lot of pressure to teach these calls, and the dancers always wanted to know them before the traveling caller was going to use them. You can't do that, because the traveling caller always came up with new ones that nobody heard yet. I, with my own club, had a standard procedure on Monday night at the club dance, the club workshop we called it, and it was a workshop because its whole purpose was to teach those calls. I put out a piece of paper and said, any calls you've heard since the last week's workshop, write them on my list here, and uh, as soon as they show up several times, I'll teach them to you. Uh, it was routine for me to have eight or nine calls on that list every Monday. Sometimes they would begin to repeat, and then I could go track them down. But we had a little problem. Where do you find out about these things? The dancers came back and told you about it, but they never told you right. You know, they, three dancers would come back, and you got a different description from all three of them. How do you cope? Uh, that led to the creation of another new experience there, the, the caller's note service. And uh, the early ones of those, uh, Will Dorek, who wasn't a caller, was a choreographic addict, I think is the fairest way to say it, uh, from the Ohio region where some of the hotshot dancers really concentrated. Uh, Willard started one of those. The Callers Association of Southern California and Northern California also published note services that were designed to let callers know about these new calls. Uh, got to be, we had 10 or 15 note services, I think that were available to us. Uh, editor of one of the late entries into that is sitting back there, Bill Peters. Uh, put out choreography breakdown, was it? Choreo breakdown. I forget. <laughs> <laughs> Published it for many years, but it was very important. Now, some of you were here when Al Brundage presented the uh, Milestone Award to Tough to get old. Uh, to a gentleman here who was honored by Colonel Depp, he turns out to have been party to one of the earliest forms of that note service, started by a group, uh, started maybe by Pappy. Uh, it was a tape, uh, first a letter that they circulated among a group of a dozen callers, and each one added local information, new call information, and they sent it on to the next one, and they had two weeks to read and add their comments and send it on. That was the earliest form of a round robin letter, and, and that grew into the note services. All of these things produced, first of all, chaos with the new calls. The dancers began to say, hey, these things aren't coming back again. You keep teaching said, Can't we get a grip on these? Uh, in that environment, Bob Osgood had been hoping somehow to bring a level of communication nationwide level of communication among callers, and he brought us together, identified as many of the leaders as he could, and invited us to a meeting in 1964 at the University of Southern, uh, University of California in Los Angeles. We had a three-day conference there, talking about leadership and the future of square dancing and how we were going to manage it, and could we work together in some way uh, it didn't immediately produce any results, and Bob kept on pushing to try to get us together. In 1970, he had created a Hall of Fame uh, and put pictures of the members that he selected for his Hall of Fame on the cover of Sentinel Magazine. By 1970, he had 13 of those and invited them, he may have had more, but he invited all of the Hall of Fame 
members to a meeting at a single arm, and 13 of them attended, they decided that there ought to be some kind of a nationwide organization of callers to address the problems that they could see in Square Dance. They went from that meeting, having identified nine statements that expressed their concern, they each then went and invited two other callers to come to another meeting the next year. I was in that second batch that came to Asilomar in 1971, or I think it was 71, uh, to talk about these concerns. It was out of those meetings that went on for two more years uh, until 1974 that we agreed that what we should do was to create an organization of callers that extended at least nationwide. And we dare not at that point think internationally, but it did come about. And that group of callers uh, met over the next three years and agreed to start calling. We came up with a name, I think, in 72, and we had a list of concerns, and it's interesting to read that list today. Uh, the statements that they came up with, they came up with nine the first time, and then added some more before we finally got there, but <coughs> by 1974, when Call Lab began, the statements that led to its creation were, let's put the dance back into square dancing. An accepted form of standardization is vital to the growth and continuation of the activity. We were very concerned with the flood of calls. Caller teacher leadership training is the responsibility of callers and teachers. Professional standards for callers and teachers need to be established. Today's square dancing is due for a reappraisal. The combination of the various parts of the square dance activity should be encouraged. How long has it taken us to get there? <laughs> The arts exist, we should be proud of it. The selfish exploitation of square dancing should be vigorously discouraged. The over-organization of dancer leader groups can pose a problem to the future progress of the activity. <laughs> By the time the convention came, we had added to those first ones some more. We acknowledge the importance of the club caller system. The National Square Dance Convention is missing the boat. What can Color Lab do to be of help to color leaders in the future? We have a need for better communications, the need for experimental movements clearinghouse, and a need to study the subject of fees for colors. We also need a means of accrediting colors. Those were the concerns that led to Color Lab. People have often said that the creation of the levels of square dancing was a mistake. The call lab shouldn't have done that. We forget that those levels were already in place before call lab's first meeting. Bob Osgood had tried in 1969 and 70 to put together a committee to establish what turned out to be the 50 basic list, and it helped a lot. It did identify what was being taught in class, but it didn't stem the flood of new calls at all. The New England Area Dancers Association sent with me to the first call at convention a petition signed by 4,000 dancers asking us to somehow get a grip on this flood of new calls and to establish a standard list that could be taught to everybody because every class taught a different list of calls yeah. in those days. There was also an article that I had copied in my book that identified the dance levels that were in existence at that time. And it almost exactly parallels what we eventually came up with. But that article was written in 1975. Against that background, we gathered in St. Louis, and John's gonna tell you what happened. 